Up to the preceding year, popular knowledge concerning the Southland must be looked upon as being mixed up with much that is both doubtful and hazardous. We now, however, reach the period which may be regarded as the beginning of the authentic history of the discovery of New Holland. In 1606, the yacht Doyfin sailed from Bantam, and, coasting along the southwest shore of New Guinea, her commander unknowingly crossed the entrance of Torres Straits, and continued his voyage along the eastern side of the Gulf of Carpentaria, under the impression that it was part of the same country. They sailed nearly to latitude 14 degrees south, when want of provisions and other necessaries compelled them to turn back. Cape Keerweer, turn again, they named the furthest point reached by them. Their report of the country was most unfavourable. They described it as being, quote, for the greatest part desert, but in some places inhabited by wild, cruel black savages, by whom some of the crew were murdered, for which reason they could not learn anything of the land or waters as had been desired of them, end quote. The name of the captain of the Doyfin, the Columbus of the South, has not been preserved. Ten years after his visit in 1616, Captain Dirk Hartog, in command of the ship Endracht, from Amsterdam, discovered the west coast of Australia. He left a tin plate on an island in Dirk Hartog's roads bearing the following inscriptions. On the 25th of October arrived here the ship Endrat of Amsterdam. The first merchant, Gillies Mybays, of Luik, Captain Dirk Hartog of Amsterdam, the 27th ditto set sail for Bantam, under merchant Jan Stoyne, upper steersman Peter Docks, from Bill, AO 1616. Captain Vlaming of the ship Gielvink found this plate in 1697 and replaced it with another, on which he copied the original inscription and added to it as follows. On the 4th of February 1697 arrived here the ship Gielvink of Amsterdam, Commandant Wilhelm de Vlaming of Welland, Assistant Jan van Bremen of Copenhagen, First pilot, Michael Blome, Van Astite of Bremen. The hooker, the Nip Tang, Captain Gerrit Collart of Amsterdam. Assistant Theodorus Hermans of the same place. First pilot, Gerrit Gerrits of Bremen. Then the galliot, Wesselt, Commander Cornelius de Vlaming of Lyland. Pilot Coert Gerrits from Bremen sailed from here with our fleet on the 12th to explore the south land and afterwards bound for Batavia. In 1801, the Botswain of the Naturalist found this plate half buried in sand, lying near an oaken post to which it had been nailed. Captain Hamelin, with rare good taste, had a new post made and the plate erected in the old spot. Another outward-bound ship, the Mauritius, touched on the west coast in 1618 and discovered and named the Willems River near the northwest Cape, probably the present Ashburton. The Leeuwen, Lioness, visited the west coast in 1622 and the well-known reef of Houtman's Abrolos was so called after Frederick Houtman, a Dutch navigator of distinction who however, never personally visited Australian shores. The next navigator to the Southland met with an untimely end. In the year 1623, Governor Cohen dispatched two yachts, the Pera and the Arnhem, on a voyage of discovery. Landing on the coast of New Guinea, Captain Jan Carstens of the Arnhem and eight of his crew were murdered by the natives. But the vessels proceeded and touched upon the north coast of New Holland, west of the Gulf of Carpentaria, still known as Arnhem's Land. A river, the Spolt, is here laid down in the old charts in the vicinity of the present Liverpool River, and there is also another opening marked the Spilt, on the eastern side of the Gulf, 
since determined to be the Endeavour Strait of Captain Cook. At Arnhem's Land, the yachts parted, the Perra continuing the voyage alone. Crossing the head of the gulf, she followed the course of the Doyfin and, passing Cape Keerweer, made as far south as 17 degrees, where the Starton River is laid down. Their report was also unfavourable, and is summed up in the official dispatches of the company thus, quote, In this discovery were found everywhere shallow waters and barren coasts, islands altogether thinly peopled by divers cruel, poor and brutal nations, and of very little use to the Dutch East India Company. End quote. Pair ahead in the Gulf is another memorial of this voyage. Now came the turn of the south coast of New Holland. In 1627, Captain Peter Neuitz, in his ship the Gold Zeppard, accidentally touched on the south coast. He followed it along for seven or eight hundred miles and bestowed on it the name of Peter Neuitz Land. The Vianen sighted the west coast in 1628 and kept in sight of it for some two hundred miles, reporting, quote, a foul and barren shore, green fields, and very wild, black, barbarous inhabitants, end quote. The wreck of the Batavia on Hopeman's Abrolos in 1629 is one of the most tragic incidents in early Australian history. The Batavia, commanded by Commodore Francis Pelsart, was separated from her consorts by a storm, and during the night of the 4th of June struck on the rocks of Frederick Haltman. The crew and passengers were landed on one island and two small islets in the neighbourhood, and the ship broke up. No fresh water was found, and Pelsart sailed in one of the boats in search of some on the mainland. He was unsuccessful and finally steered for Batavia. Meanwhile, a terrible scene of riot and murder was enacted. Jerome Cornelius, his supercargo, headed a mutiny, and those refusing to join his band were in part cruelly assassinated. One company, however, on one of the islets in charge of Waberhays defended themselves valiantly, finally taking Cornelius prisoner. Fresh water was found, and the two hostile camps awaited the reappearance of Pelsart. The design of the mutineers had been to surprise Pelsart on his return, capture his vessel, and sail away on a piratical cruise. The determined front shown by Waberhays and his party, who, although unarmed, had twice defeated them with some slaughter, disarranged their plans. When the Sardom, with Pelsart on board, hove in sight of the Abrolos, the smoke rising from the islands assured the captain, who was naturally tormented with anxiety, that some, at any rate, survived. To their surprise, a boat came off to meet them, pulled by men dressed in rich uniforms made from the silks, and stuffs that had formed part of the Batavia's cargo. Pelsart's suspicions were at once aroused, knowing as he did that insubordination had hewn itself even before his departure. These men were ordered to come on board unarmed with the alternative of being sunk and Waberhays coming off at the same time they had no choice but to obey, and the whole of the mutineers were soon in irons. After recovering most of the treasure, with the exception of one chest containing 8,000 rix dollars, a consultation was held as to the fate of the murderers. It was unanimously decided that, having in view the overcrowded state of the ship and the temptation presented by the recovered treasure, the presence of such turbulent spirits on board would be dangerous to the safety of the company. Therefore, it was thought best to try the offenders there and then instead of taking them to Batavia. This was done, and the sentences at once carried into effect. Two men, however, were condemned to the more lingering punishment of being marooned on the mainland, there to meet a cruel death at the hands of the savages. These two blood-stained criminals were the first Europeans to leave their bones in Australia, an unhappy omen of the future. According to the instructions issued to Tasman on his second voyage, he was directed to inquire at the continent thereabout, 
i.e. the neighbourhood of the Abrolos. After two Dutchmen, who, having by the enormity of their crimes forfeited their lives, were put on shore by the Commodore Francisco Pelsart, is still alive. In such case, you may make inquiries of them about the situation of those countries, and if they entreat you to that purpose, give them passage thither. He was also instructed to recover, if possible, the chest of Rick's dollars. Unfortunately, Tasman's journal has never been discovered, and it is not known how he fared on his mission. Captain Garrett Tomas Poole saved from Banda in 1636 with the yachts Klein, Amsterdam and Wessel to meet his death on the New Guinea coast in the same place that had been fatal to Carstens and in a like manner. The supercargo took charge and prosecuted the voyage, revisiting Arnhem's land. A name familiar to all is that of Abel Jans Tasman. In 1644, after his discovery of Van Diemen's land, he was sent out on a second voyage of exploration. His instructions were, quote, to discover whether Nova Guinea is one continent with the Great South Land or separated by channels and islands lying between them, and also whether that new Van Diemen's Land, Arnhem's Land, is the same continent with these two great countries or with one of them. End quote. He was also directed to search for the strait between New Guinea and New Holland in a large opening said to exist in that locality. Apparently, this portion of his instructions was, for some reasons, not thoroughly carried out. Although Tasman's journey of this voyage has never been found, we have pretty good evidence that he safely accomplished it. Dampier, in his volume of Voyages, mentions having in his possession a chart laid down by Tasman and an outline copy of the same was inlaid in the floor of the Groot Zaal in the studies in Amsterdam. The annexed tracing is from a fairly authenticated copy of Tasman's map, with the discoveries of former navigators attached, soundings being given along that portion of the northwest coast that would have embraced Tasman's proposed track. Many of the names still retained in the Gulf of Carpentaria are significant of Tasman's visit. Vandalin Island, after Cornelius Vandalin, Sweers Island, after Salomon Sweers, Maria Island, after his supposed sweetheart, Maria Van Diemen, and Lemon Bight, after his ship, the Lemon. This chart may be looked on as being the first one to give a reliable and good outline of the Australian coast as then known, namely the Endeavour Strait in the extreme north to the eastern limit of Peter Newitt's land on the south. The two placer where fresh water is marked would be the Batavia River, near Cape York, and the present MacArthur River at the head of the Gulf, the well-defined headlands shown there having been resolved by Captain Flinders into a group of islands now known as the Sir Edward Pellew Group. Tasman ships were the Limon, the Zemu, and the Tender de Brac. The first Englishman to land on New Holland was William Dampier in 1688. In very bad company, namely a crew of buccaneers who left Captain Sharp and travelled across the Isthmus of Darien, he visited the west coast of New Holland, where they remained over a month refitting and cleaning their ship. Dampier does not seem to have been on the best of terms with his shipmates for some difference of opinion arising as to the final destination of their voyage, he was, quote, threatened to be turned ashore on New Holland for it, which made me desist intending, by God's blessing, to make my escape in the first place I came near. End quote. His notes on this occasion refer chiefly to the native scene, whose personal appearance and habits he considers alike equally disgusting and repulsive. Towards the end of the year 1696, William de Vlaming, in search of the Rittershap, a missing ship supposed to have been wrecked on the coast of New Holland, came to the Great South Land. He found and named the Swan River, this being the first mention ever made of black swans, two specimens of which were captured and taken to Batavia. At Dirk Hartog's road he found, as before mentioned, the tin plate left by that captain, and after a careful examination of the coast so far as the northwest cape, left for Batavia. 
Dampier now reappears on the scene in charge of the Roebuck, a ship sent out by the English government in 1699. His account of his voyage is very minute and circumstantial, but he still retains his aversion to the unfortunate natives of whom he always speaks with the greatest scorn. Some of his statements are slightly doubtful, to say the least of it, as, for instance, one concerning the capture of a large shark, quote, in which we found the head and bones of a hippopotamus, the hairy lips of which were still sound and not putrefied, and the jaw was also firm, out of which we plucked a great many teeth, two of them eight inches long and as big as a man's thumb, small at one end and a little crooked, the rest not above half so long, end quote. Note, M. Malt Brune calls him the learned and faithful Dampier, and in corroboration of the hippopotamus story mentions that Bailey, when exploring the Swan River, heard a bellowing much louder than that of an ox from among the reeds on the riverside, which made him suspect that a large quadruped lay somewhere near him. It is remarkable that in the several accounts of the early Dutch visits to the northern coast no mention is made of alligators, Although they are so common to all the inlets and rivers of that region, the name Crocodile's Island and on one of the old chart being the sole exception. End note. Dampier disputes the accuracy of the draft of Tasman's that he had with him in many particulars and constantly advances his theory of the existence of a strait dividing New Holland into two parts, probably taking this idea, as before indicated, from the old map of the Dauphin. In 1705, the ships Vossenbach, Weyer and Nova Hollander were sent out to investigate the north coast under the command of Martin van Delft. The journals of the voyage have not been found, although a report of the notable events that happened was laid before the Governor-General of the East India Council. This was the last voyage of exploration taken by the Dutch and closes the history of the early discovery of New Holland. The existence of the southern land was definitely established, and it remained for the English and French nations to determine its size and formation with accuracy and fill up the gaps on the coastline. Sixty-five years passed before Captain Cook sailed through the Endeavour Strait, finally settling the question of the separation of this continent from New Guinea, and during that period New Holland, so far as we know, was unvisited. The association of Captain Cook with this continent is too well known to need more than a passing reference in this introduction. He proved the insularity of the South Land and he examined the long-neglected East Coast. In 1777, Mons de Saint-Alorn anchored near Cape Lewin, but no details of his visit have been preserved. In 1791, Captain George Vancouver touched on the south coast and gave the name of King George's Sound to that well-known harbour. Thence he sailed eastward. In the following year, Rear Admiral Bruni d'Entrecasteaux, in search of the hapless La Perouse, who so narrowly missed appropriating New Holland for the French, made an elaborate survey of part of our south coast. Before the close of the century, Bass and Flinders, fit companions, had commenced their daring exploits in the little Tom Thumb, and finally, with the sloop Norfolk, established the existence of the strait named after the enterprising young surgeon. In the year 1799, Flinders went north in the Norfolk sloop and followed up Cook's discoveries in Moreton Bay. In 1801, he was appointed to the investigator, formerly the Xenophon, and sailed from Spithead on the voyage which was to render him one of the leading figures in Australian history. Reaching Cape Leon, he commenced his survey of the south coast, discovering and naming the two gulfs of Spencer and St Vincent. The former he at one time thought would lead him through the continent into the Carpentarian Gulf. He reached Port Jackson in May, the year after he left England, and active preparations were soon afterwards commenced to prepare the ship for her long northern cruise. In July 1802, the investigator, with the Lady Nelson as tender, left Sydney Cove, the object of the voyage being to thoroughly survey the eastern and northern coasts. Flinders rounded Cape York, and after a close examination of the Gulf of Carpentaria, 
which, like Spencer's golf in the south, deluded him for a time with the false hope of affording an inlet into the interior, brought his work to an end at Cape Wessel, in consequence of the rotten state of his ship. He called at Copang in Timor, whence, after obtaining some supplies, he made for Port Jackson by way of the west coast. Throughout this cruise, it is evident that Flinders was much impressed by the notion advanced by Dampier that New Holland, meaning the northwest portion, was separated from the land to the south by a strait opening north of Shark's Bay. Unless, says Dampier, quote, the high tides and indraft thereabout should be occasioned by the mouth of some large river, which hath often low sands on each side of the outlet, and many islands and shoals lying at its entrance. But I rather thought it a channel or strait than a river. End quote. To quote the words of Flinders, quote, This opinion he supports by a fair induction from facts, and the opening of twelve miles wide seen by Vlemings two vessels near the same place, and in which they could find no anchorage strongly corroborated Dampier's supposition. End quote. Later information had demonstrated that the supposed strait could not lead into the great ocean eastward, as the English navigator Dampier had conjectured, but it was thought possible that it might communicate with the Gulf of Carpentaria, and even probable that a passage existed from thence to the unknown parts of the south coast beyond the Isles of St. Francis and St. Peter's. Quote, in the case of penetrating the interior of Terra Australis, either by a great river or a strait leading to an inland sea, a superior country and perhaps a different race of people might be found, the knowledge of which could not fail to be very interesting, and might prove advantageous to the nation making the discovery. End quote. This was the goal of Flinders' ambition the vision that haunted him always, the discovery of a Mediterranean sea. There being no ship in Port Jackson fit to continue the survey work left uncompleted by the investigator, Flinders determined to return to England and obtain a suitable vessel from the Admiralty. He and 22 of his men and officers embarked as passengers on the Porpoise and left Port Jackson in company with the Batavian-bound ships Cato and Bridgewater. They sailed on the 10th of August, 1803, and on the night of the 17th, the porpoise and Cato struck on a reef and became complete wrecks. The crews escaped to a sandbank adjoining the reef, and here they were left to their fate by the third ship, the Bridgewater, the captain of which vessels sailed away to Batavia without any attempt being made to save them. Discipline and order were, however, maintained on Wreck Reef Bank, as it was called, and Flinders, who took command after the vessel struck, proceeded to Sydney in the Cutter to obtain assistance for the remainder of the crews, who were to employ the time in constructing two decked boats from the timbers of the porpoise. This perilous voyage in an open boat Flinders accomplished safely, and returned in six weeks with two colonial schooners, the Cumberland and the Francis, and the ship Roller bound for Canton. The ship-direct men were taken off the bank, and Flinders started for England in the Cumberland, a small schooner of but 29 tons. On his way homeward, he was forced to put into the Mauritius to refit his little craft, before venturing round the Cape of Good Hope, and on the pretext that the passport he carried did not afford safe conduct to the Cumberland, Having been made out for the investigator, he was detained a prisoner in the Isle of France for over six years. <laughs>